Amen. Oh, hold on. Um, I want to encourage you. Uh, there, there's no right and wrong way to do this. Um, just focus on Christ. Uh, sometimes you you kind of get the hang of it right away. Sometimes it, it's not right away. Um, I felt like in the beginning uh, um, I, I felt uncomfortable because I'm used to just fixing everyone's problems. Um, I'm used to just cutting to the chase. I'm used to after the first five minutes, I already know what I'm going to say, and I just wait for him to finish. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it just, you just have to retrain yourself. Um, it takes a little time, um, but the beautiful thing is you can always revert back to what you knew before if you feel uncomfortable right away. But I, I do want to encourage us, getting people to think and take responsibility um, and take ownership, because at the end of the day, they'll stand before God alone. Amen. And, uh, boy, they need to be able to figure some of these things out. And we're really doing them a disservice when we try and figure it out for them. Yeah. Although it's in some way we think it saves us time because we can just deal with it. Um, but in the long run, um, I really believe, and I can't say in the long run this works because I haven't been doing this for the long run. Uh, this is I'm wading into new water myself. Um, as you've noticed, this now says part seven, so there was no part five or six. So. <laughs> <laughs> Five or six thing more. The next slide is part eight. So, um, those of you who's asked for the slides, even though they don't seem to have any sequential uh, stability whatsoever, if you email me, I'll send you a link to the Dropbox link, and you can have the slides. Um, I also have notes, and they don't actually coincide with all the slides. So, I'll send you the notes. That's what I meant. That I still need to work on this and package it. But um, um, I think there's enough here, and, and you know, we all have these instincts and gifts because we're in the ministry God's blessed us with it so I think you can even take it and do what you want with it um, okay let's talk about how to actually um, kind of put this into practice right um, some thoughts so the plan kind of the, the over overarching plan what is the problem what, what, what is the perceived problem right I'm stuck in my prayer life I'm I'm struggling with my impurity um, my marriage is stuck um, right now, I'm getting with a the family. Um, they've had, uh, uh, it's an, uh, an older couple in the church. All three of their kids were baptized. All three kids fell away. So I'm getting with them as a family, and I'm doing this as a family. Um, what do they say the problem is? What have the past victories been? What could Jesus do? Um, right now, one's restored, um, and the other two are, are heading back. So we're praying that um, they can just remember the line in the bear and not give up. And it's encouraging the parents not to get negative and just be discouraged. So to, to trust God. Um, so uh, first thing is let's figure out what it is. And then, you know, you never want to define things in its negative sense, but positive. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, um, I, I, I'm, I'm having lousy quiet time. So what you're saying is your vision is you want to be connected with God. Come on. You restate it as a vision. Wow. Boy, I've, I've been in porn a lot or whatever. Okay, so so you want to you want to. You want to have a. You want to have purity, or you 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 want pure relationships, or I don't feel like anybody loves me. So you're looking for close friendships. That's what you want. That's your vision. You want friendships like Christ had. Okay, yeah, I guess that's what I want. You know, I, I actually thought I was just mad at everyone for not loving me. So it's, you know, it's. So. Um, What's the problem? Restate it as a vision. Um, then the next thing we do. So what has God given us? What has already worked? And sometimes, you know, people in, are in a dark place and they say, I've never had any success ever. It's always been bad. And when people say things like that, I say, so wow, you, you have incredible perseverance. <laughs> it's, it's one of the things I appreciate about Jesus. He just never gave up no matter how dark it got. How do you do that? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a spiritual gift that, that they're still sitting there, although in their mind, it's never been good ever. So they got that going for them. You know. But I think there's always exceptions. There's always exceptions. God has always done things. It's just they get entangled. They get stuck. 
Um, so what has he given us? That's, that's the lion and the bear, right? We're looking for the past. What's already worked? Um, you know, so then sometimes, there, sometimes people don't have anything here, which, you know, I think is an illusion in their head. Right. But then you, you turn to the future. What, what's possible if, if Christ was with you? Right. If, if you went to bed tonight and you prayed, God, help me to change this. And you woke up the next morning and, and God totally answered that prayer. Mm -hmm. Totally. Tell me, tell me what that day looks like now that that's totally been solved. And they start to think through practically what would be different. And then it becomes actually quite simple. Um, and we'll, we'll look at a couple of illustrations that, um, what can God do? And then you just help them notice the progress. Um, and you prepare them to accept God's promises. Yeah, God promised this will yeah. happen. Now it's possible that it's happened and they don't even notice it. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll look at that too. And then seeking God. Then you give them, you help them to develop homework and they have a task for that week. It's not for the rest of their life because I don't remember the last time I made a decision and it stuck for the rest of my life. So yeah. let's work in the, you know, let's, let's have a victory and build on that. Um, and we'll look at verses that, that support that idea. So, What's the vision? Tell me what you wanted to get together. Tell me why you wanted to get together. You know, I did a good news sharing with my staff on, on June 1st. I said, let's share good news about how much God has blessed us, but pretend it's September 1st. Oh, wow. So everyone shared good news as if it's September 1st. I'm so thankful this summer because I met this guy, and we were there, and we were playing basketball, and I reached out to him, and we studied the Bible, and he became a Christian. So people had to describe the end of their summer now, before the summer started, so they had something that they wanted to aim for. What is it that they want to do? What is it they believe God could use them uh, to do? So what is the vision? What do you want to grow in spiritually? What seems to be the problem? If Jesus, you know, we talked about all that. Then Colossians 1, we proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. What does the Bible teach about this? What do you think God wants in this situation? What would Jesus do if you were in your shoes? So this is just, you're trying to, Help them describe what it is they want to work on, what they want to focus on. Then you just rephrase it into a goal, like I said. So you want to grow in this, or you want to see more of this, or you want to start being more patient, or more loving, or more kind. Um, the definition should never be in the absence of something, but the presence of something. This, you know, I'm, I'm sure we all understand this idea. Um, what did he give us? Gifts, talents that God has already put in you, where have we already seen victory in this? Exceptions for the problems, unnoticed gifts. When was this going well, even a little? Um, ever been a day that it's not so bad? I met with a couple who wanted to get a divorce. Um, they're in the church, and they just couldn't get along at all. And it was just, you know, it's like one of those spiral things. And, um, you know, I got with them, and, and the, the last time they could remember something good was before they got married. And the honeymoon a little bit. But there was something that they really appreciated about each other before they got married. Um, there's usually exceptions. And usually even the fact that they reach out for help, um, they make progress just from the hope of knowing that they're going to get some help. Um, you know, hope and faith are have an incredible impact on anything we do. As soon as you start to restore some hope and faith, God starts to work. Um, so we, we look for these exceptions. Um, Gifts and talents, um, like a, like we already looked at, the, the, the Christian is 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 amazing. God can um, work through them. I, I mentioned this earlier. It's important to dig um, when people share what's gone well. So, um, you know, I, I went out to the forest to pray, or um, me and my wife did this or that. And, and you ask questions like, so how did you know to do that? What, what verse inspired you to do that? Um, how were you able to stop yourself? Um, I decided not to, to look at my computer after 11 o'clock. Okay, how did you come to that conclusion? How were you able to make that decision? What, where did the discipline come from? Um, and encourage them that, that they can have victories. Um, was there ever a time this was your strength? There's some people that share, I just feel stuck in the mission. I haven't helped anyone forever. 
Okay, when was the last time you remember that that went well? Um, and then they try and remember. Well, I was a campus kid, that's why it went well. And I said, okay, so, um, and, and, you, and you just try and help them to see what it was that was good then and see if they can apply it to their life now. And we'll, we'll go through some examples of something more set. Recent, recent exceptions, um, we covered that. Okay, the future, I wanna spend one second here. When we talk about the future, God is at the center of the solution. God is the center of the solution. No matter what problem people have, God can definitely fix it. Amen? Amen. We're convinced. There's no problem you could say that God can't fix. We're absolutely convinced. Christ is absolutely the answer. We just need to have the mind of Christ. Um, the miracle question, so to speak. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now who is, to him who is able to give a measure more than we ask or imagine, according to his power that's worked within us, to him be the glory of church. God can fix anything. Christ can fix anything. There's several ways to talk about this with people. Like I mentioned, you know, what if Jesus is with you? That's one way to do it. Um, and it's interesting. Some people, they want to turn themselves in. Sometimes people feel like other people are their problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, my kids never listen to me. They drive me nuts. Okay? My kids never listen to me. Um, okay. What if your kids tomorrow listen to you perfectly? Like, describe a perfect day for your kids. And they describe it to a T. Okay, they describe the perfect day of the kids. Then I ask them, what would we see different in you when your kids start to lead themselves that way? Um, well, I'd probably be a lot more encouraging. I would stop yelling at them. One time I had a parent say, I, I wouldn't be tempted to hit them. And I would do this different, and I would be this different. Same thing with husband and wife. Could you please talk to my husband that he would spend time with me? I'm exhausted begging him for my time. I say, okay, your husband spent lots of time with you. And she describes it. And then I say to her, what would we notice different about you as soon as he started to do this? Oh, well, I would, I'd probably be a lot more respectful and I would say kind things to him. And, and then what I do is I separate them from their problem. I would say, okay, what if Jesus was with you and you woke up the next day and you wanted to just please him, even if your husband didn't notice it, but you're going to have an amazing time of just being the way Jesus would want you to be. And then it helps them see, okay, regardless of actually what my husband does for Jesus, I could actually be this way, regardless of how my husband is acting or regardless of my kid. And then they, when, you, when they actually describe what their kids would look like in their husband if they were perfect then they describe themselves in that environment then they realize there's a lot of things they would be doing different if their husband or kids were leading themselves different and then you just separate the husband and kids with Jesus and you say okay what if you were just going to do this for Jesus And then, and then they are no longer trapped by the behavior of the people around them. They're set free because now they're just trying to please God. And then when she takes that responsibility, and then I have the same talk with the husband, and he takes that responsibility, and then I give them both the task of trying to notice things the other is trying to do, Amen. then all of a sudden there becomes a wave of positive. And you're no longer trapped by how the other one's actually doing. You're just focused on Christ. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Come on, bro. I know your jet lag is setting in. <laughs> I know mine is. That would be you. My energy level is a little bit lower. We all live in the same time. <laughs> so building up our faith, First Thessalonians 5, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you're doing. Come on. So when the wife is describing how she would be different, I'm like, how would you know to do that? That's awesome. Have you, done, have you been that way in the past? And, and I build them up that they're getting confidence that they can actually be that way regardless of 
the other people in their life. Just totally encourage them. Bomb them with encouragement and scriptures and you can do this. This is awesome. When did you do that in the past? When did you do that then? How did you, how did you do that? How did you persevere? How did you, all these things, just to encourage them and strengthen them. Second Peter 1, 3, in his divine power, we know this verse, um, his power will give you the strength to be this way regardless of what's happening around you. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Now, according to our faith, now the reason it's so great that you're allowing them to describe what they would be like um, is because, you know, it, it has to be done according to their faith. Yeah. Right. All right. If they do something with someone else's faith, there's not the same result as if they do it with their own faith. Yeah. Jesus often worked according to people's personal faith. He wanted yeah. them to have their own faith in what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so you, you encourage them to come up with their plan. How did you do that? How did you manage that? Where did you learn that? How did you persevere? The lion, the bear, the slingshot. Um, you know, you think about um, sometimes I, I, when people can't seem to find anything encouraging about themselves, I say, you know, your last birthday, what did people share about you? Oh, well, they shared that I was this, but. <laughs> people sometimes are just so negative about themselves. Okay, it's your wedding. What did people say about you? It's your last birthday. It's your baptism day. What did people say when they circled up to acknowledge? What did they notice about you? And they just have to be reminded. They have to be reminded about what God has done in their life. Um, sometimes I, I ask people, what's your gifts? What, what do you think you can do? Come on, bro. And they say, oh, I, I can't do anything. And I said, what if your small group was sitting here? What if your, you know, what, what if your mom was sitting here? What would she say you could do? No? Sometimes you choose someone that's like, wow, that didn't actually help. <laughs> what did your parents say? To you? uh, what did people say at your baptism, birthday, funeral, wedding, you know? Funeral. <laughs> oh, yeah. He looks really good. <laughs> 1 Timothy 4.15, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Now, this is the next thing. Um, if Jesus is a 10 and zero is a zero, you know, where are you right now? Where, where's your prayer life? What do you think? Rate your prayer life. Christ's prayer life is a 10. Zero means you don't even believe in God. Where's that at? And I use these scaling questions a lot because... People are either in the clouds, naive, not realistic, or they can be extremely hard on themselves. And we have to help people find a way to notice progress. Um, help them to see that they're making progress. That you know, other people often see progress, um, but sometimes people don't notice it themselves. Um, most of these things that I'm talking about are great in the context of a small group. And I'll, I'll tell you how we do all of our small groups with this. Um, we choose a topic for the month, what we want to work on, and everything's done in the small group. We sit down as a small group. The topic this week is patience um, or kindness or mission or prayer life or Bible study, whatever it is. Okay, let's open up the Bible. What scriptures tell us that Bible study is important, that it can change our life, that it impacts us when we read our Bible? What verses talk to about this? We all find some verses, and we all share. Everybody shares. Okay, awesome. Um, let's take turns sharing about each person things we've noticed where they've had great convictions from the Bible. So the three of us will all share about Ed, then the three of us will share about me, then the three of us will share about somebody, and we all and everyone's sharing about each other what they're seeing in each other. This builds them up, right? And then we say, okay, where are we at today in our Bible study? Someone says I'm a five. Someone says I'm a seven. Someone says I'm a four. Someone says I'm a three. Um, you know, if, if, if we spent the day with Christ, or if we spent our quiet time with Christ, what would change about our Bible study? What would you do different? Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't start my morning on Facebook. I'd start my morning in the Bible. Or, you know, what, they come up with different ideas. Yeah. And then we just say, then we help them scale it. We say, okay, what could you do this week that would take it from his perceived four to a, a five or a six? What could you do this week? Right. We don't talk about ten uh, because, you, you know, right. You're probably not going to get to be 10 overnight. Um, but you help them figure out something that they can do. 
Um, and then as a small group, we, we watch each other and we say, okay, pick a day that you're gonna, you know, this is just gonna be your day of joy or your day of serving. Like this is it, this, this day, but you don't tell anyone that this is your day. And this day you put the mind of Christ in your head and anything you think Jesus would do as far as mission, joy, whatever it is you're talking about, whatever Jesus would do, you do it and we'll see if the small group can notice which day of the week you chose to do this. And we're all watching each other. We're trying to catch each other making progress. And then we build each other up. Um, and then at the end of the week, when we come back, we, before we start a new topic, we share which day we thought it was and how we noticed that they really made progress in this part of their life. So there's this constant desire to encourage each other, catch each other being spiritual, acknowledge it, applaud them, and everyone does it their own way. Everyone has their own, it's not like we all agreed to do this, uh, because this works for me, but it might not work for him. Um, and actually, we at times tell them, don't even say what it is you're gonna do, surprise us. See if, see if we can notice um, you putting these scriptures into practice. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Rough stuff, bro. Oops, sorry. I hit the wrong button. Oh. Seeing progress, scaling questions. Um, mega negative people. Um, sometimes someone says, I actually got with the team who's decided to fall away. And I said, why are you falling away? He said, because I don't believe in God anymore. I said, oh, okay. So tell me, on a scale of zero to 10, 10 is God exists as much as I'm sitting in this room. Zero is there's absolutely no chance God exists at all. Zero. And you would like to be struck down by lightning right now if he does exist. <laughs> How confident are you? Zero. That's that 10. Where are you at? And he said, well, I think I'm a one. <laughs> I said, so, so what you're saying is you... you God may exist, right? So why don't you tell me why you want so desperately for God to stop existing? What is it you want to do that's going to make it easier for you to do what you want to do? And he said, well, and then he started confessing um, his sin. And it's just good to kind of lay that out and help people fess up to what it is they're really trying to say. Um, how do you feel about your relationships in the church? One. And he thinks that's going to startle me. And I'll say, really? So wh why isn't that a zero? <laughs> well, it's not that bad. So, so what's good about it? Why isn't it a zero? Tell me something that's good. That, that, what? It's like, well, you know, this brother did do that. And this, and, you know, and the, some of it's just emotion. Some of it's just being negative, being yeah. down. But... If you call him on it, I had one person tell me a zero. I said, so why not a minus two? <laughs> you know, you there, there, there's a... <laughs> but we just help people to describe things. Um, we help them to make progress. Um, and then we strengthen them in their resolve to change. Matthew 10, 42. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water, God doesn't always need something miraculous in these incredible deeds. If, if we can just get the cup of water going, um, get them back on track believing that they can move forward with whatever it is they feel like they're stuck in. Because as soon as you take that little step, no matter how small it is, you have faith to take a second step. But there's some people it's been so long since they've taken a step that they don't even believe they can do it anymore. Yeah. And it's usually not across the board. It's just in part of their Christian life. Mm. Right. Some people, they're cranking along in one area, but they're just stuck in this area. And if you can help them define what that next step looks like in their terms, and then encourage them deeply that they'll take it. And then when they take it, you're there to be their fan and encourage them and acknowledge that they're <laughs> obeying the scriptures. This builds momentum. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Awesome. Second Peter 1 5 9, we see this concept here. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness, knowledge, and the knowledge, self-control, and self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness. Godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities, here it is, in increasing measure. 
in increasing measure. If you can help acknowledge that something's increasing, help them catch it. And don't tell me the Holy Spirit can't do it. All right. Don't. Because he can. Amen. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Is that not what it means to be stuck? In your knowledge, once again, Christ's focus of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind, has forgotten his lion and his bear, and that he's been cleansed from his past sins. Yes. Wow. Right? Yep. Right. Right. So we help set them up to make that next step. Do not miss, listen, merely listen to the word. So there's usually two things I, at the end of every small group meeting or any time we have discipling, there's two things I ask them to do. One of them is an observation thing. The other one is something to do. I try and get them to observe. I just actually, there's a guy, a, a campus kid who's about to get baptized and he passed the cost counting, but then the parents felt like he's not ready. Now the, the parents are a little bit hard on their boy, <laughs> a little bit negative but also he didn't take some things serious that he should have at home. Um, so we had a talk and um, I, I pulled the parents aside and I said, look, I said, your, your son's made some great progress. I said, could you tell me everything you've noticed in your son this last two weeks that he's really changed? And they started listing it off. Now when we sat down with him, with the parents, they were like, did you know he did this? Did you know he did that? Did you know he did this? Did you know he did that? So I got the kid out, and I said, I said, tell me all the things you've noticed in the last two weeks that he's really grown and changed. They looked at me like, didn't you hear my last speech? <laughs> but I just waited, and they started to notice things. They noticed him having his quiet times. They noticed him serving at home. They noticed him helping out. They noticed him <laughs> serving the neighbors. He noticed him sharing his faith. They, they noticed a lot of things. And I said, okay, he, here's the deal. You need to encourage your son. Mm -hmm. Amen. You need to encourage him. And the only time they'd open the Bible with him it was to show him he's doing something right. wrong. Right. I said, I want you to open the Bible every day with him, but to show him a verse that's positive and show him that you're seeing him living this out. I want you to look for it and find it. Observe this. I want you to catch him doing things right. And you be his fan. We're his disciple. We're on his case. But you're going to be his fan for the next three days. Then I pulled him aside and I said, look, you've, you've got to get serious about this decision to be a disciple. Right. And then I asked the parents, I want you to watch for him to do things right. And then I encouraged him and spurred him on to do things right. And uh, I got an email yesterday. It's the second day. And the dynamic at home is getting better. They're encouraging him. Now he wants to come home. He wants to spend time with them. He wants to do things at home because he feels they're behind him. And just the dynamic change, but from very simple things. But observation is huge. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, hear what you hear, but did not hear it. It's out of context, obviously. But the idea that if you're not looking for it, you're not going to see it. Right. And uh, we gave a, I, I always give them a challenge to observe. Um, then I give them um, a challenge to do something. Um, like, for instance, the guy who wasn't praying um, decided to get up and go out early. And I said, pick a day next week. Not every day, because sometimes we, we say, oh, I'm going to do this every day. Yeah. And then they mess up on the third day, and they're all discouraged, and they're, 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 they're discouraged. Pick a day. And uh, actually, with the family, um, the, with the kids who had all fallen away, I asked them what could be different at home. And each one of them shared different things, like the house could be clean, or this or that, or this or that, or... If I came home, the first question wouldn't be, did I do my homework, but I'd just get a hug. There were very simple things the kids wanted and the parents wanted, and they actually didn't know that this is what was important to them. And actually, the mom started to tear up when the kid said, I just wish when I came home, my mom would first hug me before she asked me anything else. And the mom starts to tear up. And the mom shared, I just wish when he was on his way home, if he would just pick up the phone and and ask if there's anything I could get on the way home, just to know that he's thinking about our family as well. This, these are five people, they live in one room, wow. all together. And 
there were very simple things that were touching to them, but they just didn't know. That's how each other feel, yeah. felt. Now, they were supposed to pick a day throughout the week to do whatever they wanted, but they all did everything the very next day. Because <laughs> they were so excited about just changing wow. these simple things that seemed to mean a lot to the other person, but just didn't actually mean anything to them. Um, so observing, then give them a homework uh, assignment. And then um, you ask, so what got better? You know, wh where did you see God move? What, what, what scriptures came alive in your life this week? And it's just very simple. That, that's basically what it is. You, someone defines the issue. You restate it as a vision because Christ was the perfection of anything we want to accomplish in our life, whether it's relational or spiritual or whatever. You help them find the lion and the bear. If they don't find it, you help them create the situation to define it if Christ was with them. Then you just encourage them, strengthen them, and then ask them to observe. On the day you're going to be mega respectful to your husband, watch what changes in him. See if anything changes in his reaction to you. Just observe. Just observe the kids. Um, and, and it goes both ways. One of, one of the kids I got with, he felt like the parents were driving him nuts. And I said, okay, let, let's come up with a strategy to get your parents off your back. What could you do that would get your parents off your back? Well, I could come home and actually clean up my room and do dishes. And if they did that, they'd probably leave me alone. And I said, okay, why don't you try that? <laughs> you know, the trust issue. One, one girl shared that her mother drives her nuts by calling. Mother's worried a lot about her. So the, they found a compromise. The mother decided to text. She said, I feel fine about a text. I just don't like getting the calls all the time. That extended trust to her. She was more responsive. And now they're, they're much closer. Sometimes it's a little thing. Um, but people get stuck. Um, so you just help them get unstuck. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Let me give a couple of concrete examples. All right. Um, Let's go, bro. Awesome. <coughs> Our discipling was broken down in Kiev, um, and our small groups were not working. So I got the staff together, and I just asked them, I said, share with me your best experience in a small group. What's the best experience you've ever had in your Bible? What's the best Bible talk you've ever had? Let's share about it. People started raising their hands. It was awesome because we did this, we did that. It was family. We were converting people. We were fired up. We were this, we were that, we were this. What verses tell us that being in small groups and having those kind of relationships are important. And we found the verses, so we got charged up. How do you guys all rate your small groups right now in your sector? Let's just hear numbers. People are like four, five, six, one, two, ten, you know, the whole range. I said, what is something you could do this week that would, in your leaders meeting, that will strengthen the small groups in your sector? Let's hear one thing you're gonna do. What's the one thing you think that will Help move it from whatever it is to a little, it's not gonna fix everything, but what's the one thing this week we can talk about to get this moving forward? And then everyone's listening to everyone's victories and how they're gonna do it and what they're thinking and, and it became an incredible time. It took about 45 minutes and everyone went home with like a list of five or six things that they thought they could do to move their small groups in their sector forward. So you can do this in a large scale setting like I said, we do it in our small groups. Um, the goal is peace, the goal is patience, the goal is mission, the goal is our evangelism. Whatever it is, we look at the verses, we share about success stories, um, times God has worked, and then we just talk about what can we do this week to make this happen. And then we come back and we encourage each other about the victories, amen? And if something didn't work, we don't do it again. Let, let's do something else um, and not get stuck. Um, Okay, example. Uh, we did mission because we, we weren't having a lot of visitors in the campus, as many as we felt like we should have. So we, we did this with the small groups in mission. And the great thing is that it takes the pressure off their small group leader because he doesn't have to be an expert. He doesn't have to tell everyone what to do. He's got to get people to commit to doing what they believe God can use them to do. 
So we started out with some scriptures on the mission. We talked about it. Then we shared about how the mission happened in our life. Obviously, the mission happened to them. That's why they're sitting in the church. Um, and then they shared about times where they've had success in the mission. And then we then we do the future thing. Okay, let's all share. Wednesday, you wake up, and God's put in you this spirit of wanting to help people be saved. And Jesus says, I'm with you all day long. We're going to find some people. We're going to share our faith today. Tell me what's going to be different. You went to work. What's different at work? Who are you talking to? What are people noticing? And some, one of the brothers says, well, I, I'm not flirting with the person that you, okay. <laughs> Good. That's <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, <Rob>. Mental note. <laughs> 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 I sit with somebody different at lunch. I ask them about their weekend. I share with them about my weekend. What else would you say to them? What else would you do? Who else might you meet throughout the day? And everyone kind of shares their perfect day if like Jesus joined them in sharing faith for that day. And then we all decide, let's pick a day this week. And, and on that day, we decided to do it all together. Let's all do this on Thursday. Thursday is going to be our mission day. So in the morning, let's wake up and send each other our favorite verse about the mission. And then from the moment we walk out to the moment we come home, we are just, we have the mind of Christ. And we're just begging God to bring open hearts. And we're not going to do this every day, but Thursday, this is it. This is going to be awesome. And it may be a little challenging. We all kind of, and we, and we kind of scaled the count. How do you feel from, you know, 10, you can't wait to hit the streets to zero. I think I'm going to be sick that day and lay in bed all day. <laughs> Where are you at? <laughs> oh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a two probably. Okay, but why aren't you a zero? Oh, because we should save people, right? I mean, I'm just, <laughs> so you're just, you're just helping them get confidence. And then one of the guys who was very nervous and very insecure, I said, I'm going to come to your institute on that day. We're going out together. Wow. I was like, oh, okay, great, thanks. So, you know, that'll be awesome. And the other guys were okay, so they went off as a couple, you know, they decided to pair up. And we had just an awesome day. And then at the end of the day, like, why don't we do this all the time? This is incredible. You know, but it, the, just hearing the challenge from the stage, we should be evangelizing or sharing our faith. Yeah, I know that, but, I, you know, how do I do that? What does that look like? And, yeah. and when we had that concentrated day with a very concrete goal, um, people also kind of figured out what's working, what's not. And then the next week we do something different and, and so on. Um, so that's how it works with the small groups. Um, wow. Amen. Um, With marriage, you know, and, and with people who blame the other person, right? Um, that it's not me, it's, it's this other person, that's why I'm struggling. Um, describing things with a husband and wife is also excellent to have them describe what it is they're looking for. Um, with the married couple who wanted a divorce, nothing's good, I can't stand this person. I said, okay, Jesus wakes up. You're, you wake up that morning and Jesus is with you. Describe your morning. What do you do? Describe what is your wife doing? Well, she would hug me in the morning. She would this, she would that. Um, he would text me from work. When he'd come home, he wouldn't go to his computer. He would sit down and talk to me. And when I asked him, where's your relationship from zero to 10? They said zero. It's just, it's zero. I said, okay. And then the husband described the Jesus day, how he would act if Jesus was with him. And I said, so how do you feel emotionally about that day you just described? And he said, well, if we had a day like that, it would probably be an eight. And I said, how do you feel about how he described that day? How would that feel for you? She said, I, I think it would be an eight too. And I said, did he describe anything that seems impossible to you? Mm. Wow. Right. Come on. Text. 
cook dinner, hug? Is there, is there anything here on the realm of impossible? I mean, do we even need a miracle to see any of that happen? Wow, amen. And it was, it was so concrete. And then she did the exact same thing. I would wake up. Um, the dishes would be in the dishwasher from what he had breakfast because he leaves earlier. He might have even left a note for me on the table. This, I would call. I would cook dinner when he came home. We'd have time to go for a walk. I'd clean up the dishes quickly. And then we loved to watch movies. They finally found something that they actually declared something they liked. <laughs> they decided to watch a movie, and I said, okay. And then I separated. I said, look, for Jesus, can you please? <laughs> And there was a moment. There was a moment when it started to get ugly, and I, in the beginning, before that whole description thing. And I said, "Look, I said, be very careful here. You are talking about a child of God. Step easy here. Um, you may be feeling a lot of things, but this is God's child, who Jesus died for. So can you can you restate that again? I can't accept that description for somebody that God deemed worthy to die for." So let's start over. Wow. Right? Yep. Yep. So they started over in a little bit more humble <laughs> about their position. And the things they described are so simple, but they're things that have just worn and torn on them for so long um, that they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so I said, so you do this, and, and whether she notices or not, it has nothing to do, you're doing this for Christ. And you are going to do this for Christ. Not if he notices or not. You just do it for Christ. And literally, their, their, their marriage is turned around. It's literally turned around. Awesome. Amen. Um, they got unstuck. And it wasn't because the other one changed. It's focus on Christ first. Amen. And that decision, I love Jesus enough to do this no matter what my circumstances are. Right. And then both of them making effort. Then I gave them you know, the, the same homework. Observe. Observe. Try and catch your husband doing any of this, even a little. Yeah. Try and catch your wife, any of this, even a little. Now, you listed tons of things that would be in your perfect day. You can't do all of them, but try and have a great day and choose two or three of these things to do. And usually they try and do all of them, but you just take the pressure off. Yeah. Um, and then there's progress. And then they catch him doing it right, and there's progress. Um, but the focus amen. is on Christ. Amen? Yes. Amen. amen. Um, you know, I think that's... Uh, Yeah, that's um, the majority of my notes. Come on. Um, so, um, then I have, a, I have a whole series with what to do with people who want to fall away. Oh. Um, you get with someone who wants to fall away, and uh, you, you just try and turn them around. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. So, if you had the opportunity to be able to share something like that before a group, how would you go about that? Okay. Okay, someone, someone, these are some of my notes. I'll send this to you. Um, Amen. But, um, I pull a kid to get, you know, say someone's missed church a bunch and he's kind of avoiding me. You know, you probably have people that have avoided you. Um, I pull him aside and he's not initiating, I'm initiating, right? I say, do you, do you have 40 minutes? Could you just give me 40 minutes? I just love to, I know it's not an easy time, but I just want a chance to encourage you. Can I, can I grab 40 minutes of your time? Um, are you asking like on the spot? Like in, yeah, okay. like like after church. Like, I'll just grab him um, if he shows up at church. Um, I ask him what the problem is. Um, I look for the lions and bears. I ask him to share his conversion story. Tell me, tell me what that was like. 
how, how was God able to do all that in your life? How did you make those decisions? I try and um, get that spark back. Then um, I ask, is there any moment in the last week or two where you didn't feel this way? Is there any moment that you felt even a little bit better? What was it? Why? Well, because I was at church or, you know, or I actually read my Bible that day. Okay, why does the Bible have that impact on you? Why? What, how does that work for you? You know, and they, they, you try and connect them with that. Um, then I say, okay, you're overwhelmed. This problem's killing you. Imagine this. Imagine, I read them Ephesians 3, and I said, okay, you, you go to bed at night, and the problem's gone. God totally answered your prayer. Describe to me what your next day looks like. And sometimes it's with them or it's in context. What would your wife notice? What would your friends notice? What would the church notice? Well, the church would notice that I showed up. Okay. And what do you think the reaction to that would be? Well, they'll probably be fired up to see me. I was like, okay, when you see them fired up to see you, how are you going to feel? Well, I'll probably feel fired up. Okay. So when you're fired up, how much more fired up will the church? You know, you, just, you help them to see. Sometimes it's this little thing. Um, but if they're all negative and there's nothing good, um, I go to Matthew 12, uh, verse 20. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized you except what's common to man. I try to normalize their situation. Yeah, yeah it's, it's bad, but it's not... I mean, this is why Jesus hung on the cross. He, he knew you were going to hit walls like this. This is all overcomable. You can overcome this. Uh, Romans 8, 31, 32. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who could be against us? Hugh did not spare his own son. He gave him up for all of us. Uh, along with him, graciously give us all things. Wow. It's impossible for you to tell me there's something that could actually stop God from loving you and fixing this. Jesus can totally fix this. And I try to inspire them uh, to not give up. Um, if nothing good, no desire, nothing at all, um, and it keeps going down, um, Hebrews 10, 23, 25, let us hold on swerving to the hope we profess. He who promises faithful, let us consider how to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Um, how long have you noticed you've been swerving? Right? How long has this been challenging for you? I'll usually ask him for, describe life if this totally went away. And then I'll ask him, I say, could you give me two weeks? You, you can always fall away and leave and quit. Don't, don't worry, there's plenty of time to do that. I'm not limiting your options here. I'm asking you to delay them. Give me two weeks and let's do the things you described when you first became a Christian or your perfect day. And then at the end of those two weeks, if you want to leave, the, the door's all, it's, this is always going to be a volunteer sport. Christianity is always going to be volunteer. And, but I know if they give their heart again, yeah. if they right. seek, they'll find. Yeah. If they knock, the door yeah. will open. Yeah. But we have to get them to engage again. And if they describe it, it's not me describing to them what they have to do to get strong. If they can describe it, yeah. Yeah. then inspire them to do it. Yeah. Call them to do it. Um, now, if that doesn't work, <laughs> Hebrews 10, 26 to 31, if you deliberately keep on sinning, <laughs> after we receive the knowledge of the truth, for forgiveness of sins, you know, you guys know that verse, right? Yeah. What will happen if you continue on this path? <coughs> well, there, there's wrath. Okay, why would there be wrath? Well, because Christ's sacrifice isn't enough for me. Can you actually hear yourself saying that? Is what you want right now outweigh the blood of the Son of God? Are you that sure this is exactly what you want? And I try and persuade them mm -hmm. to fess up what they're saying. I want them to say it. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
They need to own what yeah. they're about to do yeah. based on the scriptures. Yeah. And then I plead with them to give it one more try, to re-engage. Um, and then if that doesn't work, <laughs> if, if it's that cooked, then I go to Hebrews 6, 40, 4 through 6. Ooh. It's impossible for those who've been enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift. And I'll say, you know, I don't know exactly how that all works. It's a little bit like Russian roulette. You don't actually know when the bullet's going to go off. But you're, you're, you're playing with yeah. your eternity. Yeah. 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 Um, so, if I get a positive response to any of those stages, I immediately try and just scale it. Say, so what's the one thing you could do this week that you think could help you Take a step forward. And I'll ask him, what do you believe you need from me? What do you believe you need from your small group? What do you need to help give you the extra faith? And usually they'll ask, I need help. I need, can you pray with me? Can you go with me? It's always yes. But I don't want to tell them what they have. They, they have to own it has to be something they believe in and they want to do. Yeah. Um, I think it helps them take responsibility. Yeah. So does that does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I have I have all this very detailed with the different responses I got and the things I used in the scriptures and <laughs> the responses and maybe you'll find it helpful. But um, yeah. sure. um, the more you do this, the more you realize. The Bible's got the answers. Yeah. Christ yeah. is clearly the solution. Yeah. They got stuck on a problem, and if they just switch to look at Christ, then they don't have to dwell on the why or the guilt or the judgment or the, the negativity. They can just turn to Christ and say, if Jesus was in, what would he want me to do? And we can leave our sin on the cross, and we can strive forward to be more like Christ, which I think is what really pleases Christ when he sees us trying to be more and more like him. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Amen, yeah. So in my, my men's group, we've done love. In our small group, we've discussed love, mission, prayer, Bible study, patience, self-control, purity, sacrifice, fellowship, marriage, parenting, and relationships in the church. We've done small groups with that, all that, where they write out the scriptures they love, they list all the things they're thankful to God of how God's already worked in their life in these areas. Wow. And then they come up with new things to add to the list because they also get encouraged from their small group to keep striving forward. And um, so, amen? amen. And, and sometimes there's times also when, uh, uh, you know, someone said, I'll, I'll do this. And then that week they didn't do it. And I don't get mad at them that they didn't do it. I, they just kind of came to the conclusion as well as I do that that's actually probably not what they needed to do or believe they should do. Um, so, but I make them keep searching. Um, to, to put it into practice what it is that works for them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So I guess I'm done. Maybe some questions or something if there's anything. Uh-huh. Amen. Um, obviously there are some times you might have a conversation like this and I assume that it changes quickly. The person, you know, maybe just needed that one really encouraging conversation that you helped them to see what they needed. But what do you do? How do you handle the person that's going to need, you know, months of follow-up as a man leading a church? Do you bring a small group leader into that initial conversation so that that person can then follow up? Or how do you handle that? Because I feel like it could potentially be you having a ton of follow-up conversations over the course of time. Uh-huh. Um, um, I think, you know, with, with the family that got stuck, um, they rated their family like a two or three the first time we met. It was a five or six the second time. And then after the second time, I said, what do you feel like it needs to be at that you don't, want to, you don't need to see me anymore? <laughs> and they said, probably a seven or eight. That's, that's good enough. And I said, so what do you think you could do this week to get it to a seven or eight? <laughs> <laughs> And they, they, they all had ideas. 
Um, one of the kids said, I want to go on a picnic. The other one said, I want to go on a prayer walk. The other one said, um, you know, actually, one of the kids, they, they don't have enough chairs actually at their table. Um, and so one of them sits on the floor during dinner. And he feels really bad about that. Um, he feels like he's just not important and he feels put down. So it, it was just that. So, you know, we, we pitched in and bought a chair. So, <laughs> And then he's fired up. <laughs> you know, and actually, one of the hilarious thing, everyone in the family complained about the cat, that they can't stand the cat because the, the, the cat stinks. It smells. And the apartment's too small. And I said, okay, so everyone wants to get rid of the cat. Why do you still have the cat? And that became one of the things, to get rid of the cat. So they got rid of the cat, and everyone was feeling so much better about the cat. <laughs> So, but I think in general, um, um, you know, I think I, that's, I'm glad actually that you said that. It reminded me of something. If I have some time with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, I have them always go back to their small group that week and share. So if the person decided he's going to really change the way he gets up and has his quiet time, I say, can you please share what you shared with me with your small group and tell them this is what you want to work on. Um, so that they can encourage you and also notice the things you're changing as you're making progress because they're the ones that see you all the time. Um, and tell them that you're, you're working on your anger or tell them that you're working, no, not on your anger, you're working on being kind. Uh, tell them they're working on your purity or tell them that you want to have deeper relationships, that you feel lonely. If you open up and tell your small group that, um, then they can help you um, because the reason you feel like they don't initiate as, you know, you reflected, you know, I guess I don't initiate either. Um, so if you started initiating, what would you notice in your small group different? Well, they'd probably initiate with me. And okay, well, for Jesus, you do this, whether your small group gets it or not. But then I want you to share with your small group that this is the thing you really want to be more like Christ in. Yeah. You want to be more kind and giving. And then the small group, they're like, wow, awesome. I, I was, we always felt like you didn't want to connect with us anyway. And it just, so... I make them be accountable because the great thing about this is that, that your answer is in Christ and in the scriptures. It's not in a person. Right. And, and I don't give them the answers. Um, and, and the small group then doesn't have to continue to not give them answers. They just have to continue to draw them out and help them see that they're making progress. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So, uh huh. I love your, all of the focus on Jesus, on Christ, and I think that, you know, the vision for a Christian is to be like Jesus, and I'm thinking about if you're, if you're helping somebody, and you, you want, like, if I'm in a situation, I think, I'm thinking, I want to be like Jesus here, but, of course, Jesus handled things differently with different people, and so my dilemma is um, maybe even second-guessing myself, because I'm thinking, well, am I being too merciful here or am I or maybe I'm thinking well, maybe I shouldn't be so specific about them needing to repent so you know even that dilemma that you face when you say I know I'm trying to be like Jesus but I, I just wonder how you handle that or if you have any practicals about how you can sort of feel the confidence and yet at the same time be humble you know I know that there's no easy answer to that but I right. just wonder if you've thought about it that way wow that's that's a incredible question I think um, you know I think I think maybe you know I, I didn't even know I would need time to think about how I would answer that uh, off the cuff I would say if a week later they feel at the same place then there's probably something that needs to be more focused from the scriptures maybe there needs to be more of an accent on Okay, maybe there wasn't enough expectation here, or maybe I'm not engaged. You know, maybe I need to adjust something. Sometimes people come back and their their prayer life was a four, and then they came back and they feel like my prayer life's still a four. I'm like, so, so, you know, why didn't it become a three? Why didn't it go down to a two? Um, and because the negativity is so ingrained yep. at right. times. So why didn't it go down to a two? And sometimes people were at a four, they came up with their own assignment, then they come back the next week and say it was a two. And then I say, <laughs> why wasn't it a zero? Well, because, you know, and I just think, 
there's so much power in just faith and hope. Yeah. I mean, you even know the secular world stories of people who just had so much hope that they were able to overcome certain things. And I just think, um, according to your faith, it'll be done. Yeah. So I think if we can keep refocusing them on what can God do, the Spirit, and then I, that I think also just using the Scriptures, what, what do you think Jesus would expect? What's he expect? Well, he expects me to be perfect. Really? Are you sure? I think he wants you to give your whole heart. But it's interesting because sometimes people have very, it's very interesting, and it challenges my picture of God because I don't think my picture of God's always right. But I think in a small group, in a small group, usually you have the different character types to balance each other. Um, so I guess that's, I don't know, I'm going to have to think about it. That's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to throw another hard question at you. No. Um, the stuff you're sharing I mean, really resonates, I think, especially working with Mary's, people who've been around a long time. We have a lot of leaders in here leading campus, teens. Right. I mean, in some of this, somebody's beginning their Christian life, and you say, well, think about what Jesus would do. They barely know Right. Who, who Jesus, Jesus is. is. Is there anything you would share maybe that would be a little different right. in these kind of settings? Um, I also leave the campus. You know, I, I even think, even the way I'm studying the Bible with people right now, I'm, I'm noticing myself tweaking it some. Um, see God with all your heart. I'm studying the Bible right now. I met a guy just last week. He's a professional basketball player. That doesn't say much in the Ukraine, but still. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> but he's a professional basketball player, and, um, and uh, we were doing Seeking God study, and I said, so what have you ever done with all your heart? And, you know, I know what he's done. He plays basketball with all his heart. And I said, describe that to me. What does that look like? get up early, I don't do this, I don't do that, I do this. He restrains himself because he has this vision. Right? So, so what do you think it means to seek God with all your heart? Mm. Well, meeting with you, reading the Bible, you know, things like that. And he's coming up with, with these ideas. Obviously, we, we all know these ideas. Okay, um, if you seek God, you find him. If you knock, the door opens. But in this next verse, it says... The, the wide road that leads to destruction narrow and only a few find it so if everyone who seeks finds always but so few find it what does that say people really don't seek with all their heart because if they did they'd find it and so what do you think this means for you and he said I, I need to be as serious about God as I am about my basketball I need to be, and then he said no, no no I need to be more serious about God than I am about basketball I said, so how much do you devote yourself to basketball every day? He said, from the moment I get up, the moment I go to bed, I'm training or thinking about training. I said, so what's Christianity going to look like for you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, so, so what do you want to do? After I said, so what do you want to do? Now I'm going to, you know, I agree. I'm going to have to tell him if he doesn't know. Um, but he said, I, I think I need to get with you every day and study the Bible. Wow. And I said, that's an excellent idea. <laughs> now, I would have given them that, but you still give them some wiggle, because if they can come to it on their own, and you know, you think about the first century, I don't think the people there were that, they're not that smart, right? I mean, we're not dealing with, you know, probably the most educated people in the world, yet they were able to change the world, which means it's simpler than we all think. Amen. We make it much more complicated than it is. Yeah, right. So if I can just focus it on Christ, yeah. find the victories even from their worldly life. Mm -hmm. He knows what's seeking God with all heart. And his, his parents were killed. Um, his parents were killed. So he knows what pain is. He knows what sacrifice is. He, wow. he knows what devotion is. I'm just asking him questions about his life, and I'm picking out these things. And then I form the questions. that Those start to become his lions and bears that he can draw strength, that he can be a great Christian. So I think that's that's probably um, what I would do. Um, once again, the more things that we can do, the more energy and ideas and examples we can come up with. Um, other, uh-huh. Um, I'm a little confused by the problem. I'm 
line of thinking, this is all very helpful, but if, if someone's problem is like, I've always wanted to be married, I've always wanted to have children, or my mom died, or I have cancer, or something like that, do you take them down the line of thinking of like, well, imagine if Jesus solved the problem, and then do you right. focus on their contentment with that? Like, how would you go down that avenue? Um. Hmm. <laughs> you guys are getting very sleepy right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, once again, I, I, I'm sure I'll come up with a good answer about an hour from now. But there's a couple uh, from Odessa who led the Odessa, lead the Odessa Church. And um, last May, um, one of the teens was walking um, their nine-year-old daughter across the street, and a car ran the red light and hit her and killed her. Oh, my goodness. And... Um, they adopted a child because she could not get pregnant. And they adopted him, it's a little boy, his name's Dima. And then two years after that, she got pregnant. After, I don't know, 14 years of trying, never happened. She got pregnant and it was Xenia, their daughter, uh, that at the age of nine was hit by a car and killed last May. So we brought them out of Odessa, leading the church to Kiev and I put them in the campus ministry with me and Lena to see if we could salvage um, them. And uh, you know, of course that's extraordinarily tragic. Mm -hmm. And to be able to stand up and preach to people that God loves us mm -hmm. and God is patient and God hears our prayers, to preach that with all your heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. she, when she was hit by the car, um, they brought her to the hospital. She got hit right next to a hospital. The number one surgeon in Odessa just happened to be there. Wow. So, so many things were in place that you would think she's going to make it. And the doctor said there's 0.1 chance, percent chance of her making it. And he said, you know, do the operation. And they did the operation. She was getting better. She was able to take liquids, even though she, so there was making progress that she died. Oh. And, um, you know, this was obviously very brutal. Oh. Um, but the same, actually, to be honest, and he knew because we had trained in this together, but I would just get with him. I'd say, so how are you doing today? And he's like, so. Siri not available. <laughs> <laughs> you know, zero to 10, where are we at? And he's like, minus five minus 10, whatever, and I said, was there anything, anything this last week, even the smallest thing that brought you some kind of encouragement or comfort? No? Okay. Keep looking. Keep looking. Watch and see if this next week you see anything that you get some kind of comfort Anything that encourages you, anything, no matter, even if you think it doesn't even count, make a note. Have together next week. So, how are you doing? Where are you at? I'm going minus two. I was like, oh, you were minus five last week. What happened? Like, well, you know, I went for a walk and had a good, just cry with God. I said, so, so crying helps you. Is that? Yeah, that would help. Okay, great. Mm. I'm just collecting. Mm. What is it? Next week, minus 30. It was her birthday. Oh. Minus 60. You know, it's we're not even in the zero zone. We're we're somewhere off the chart. Yeah. But over the year, you know, it got back up, and um, I think if you ask him now, he's probably a one mm. or a two. Um, but there's times when he's had a five or a six. And um, God totally blessed. She's pregnant. Mm. Wow. Um, so now he's like an eight. Mm -hmm. He feels like she made it to heaven. She's okay. Amen. Now I'm going to have another child. Wow. 
you know, there's there's a couple times where I had to intercede with, you know, he was just down in the dumps, and I said, look, bro, you know, I said, there's worse stories than this one. Yeah. I said, there's parents who stand at a grave burying a 16-year-old who never became a Christian. Right. Now, that's a tragedy. Your girl, she wouldn't come back even if you promised her all the candy in the world. She likes where she is. And, you know, that, that's, you don't do that every week, but every once in a while you, <laughs> you, you have to also bring it into, so you got to take off the worldly eyes and look at the eternal picture. And, I mean, I've prayed that prayer. God, if my kids won't make it. Sure. <laughs> take them. Right. As Christians, our, our goal is eternity, right? It's not, it's not a good life. What's a good life? I live in Ukraine. <laughs> right? It's about a good life. There's, there's other ways to do this. Right? That's right. Come on. You know, and it doesn't always work out. Not all the kids will make it, and, and then... You know, so but we, we fight for that. We believe in that. We believe in the eternal thing. We weigh it more than what the world has to offer. So, but I think that, that I think the same thing applies. This week, I want you to look for a verse where you might find some comfort. Find a verse this week that would find comfort. Just hmm. little bitty tasks, little bitty tasks, just to make them feel like there is a way at the end of this tunnel. I just have to keep. It may take me 40 years to get there, but I will, yeah. I will go. And then I just notice the improvements. I just encourage them along the way. So, uh-huh. <coughs> you guys stop this whenever you... Okay. We'll go Can a you tell us a little bit about the structure of your church and how many people you get with or you see? Because it sounds like you spend a lot of time even with teens. So I'm like, how do you right. do all of it? I come to awesome conferences like this. I, I run. For, no. Uh, <laughs> the structure of the church, or the structure of my life, or um, well, um, we, you know, the the base the base structure of the church is small groups. We have Bible talks. Um, sec, you know, in region leaders, and um, um, I have people I disciple. Uh, there's three region leader couples I disciple. Then there's the four kids in the mission school. So hmm. that's kind of my my responsibility. Um, so that's, I don't know. I don't know exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and and then I'll try and uh, you know, if people get stuck. With, with something, um, you know, I'll try and get involved, but, you know, I'm reading lots of books right now about how to better manage my life, because I feel like um, Rob Skinner, yeah. Rob Skinner's teaching on the template he laid down for how he lives his life was very challenging and very encouraging for me. Um, and I think, I think life looks a little different dependent on the size of the church, because there's different challenges you face is the structure gets larger but I'm, I'm striving to find the template for a big church what does a big church leader's life look like um, what would that look like so I'm working on that but um, same thing just try and make progress what, what's working what's not um, asking lots of people what books they've read trying to learn grow so open for any advice anyone has <laughs> That was one question I had was, as you did this research and stuff, were there resources that you read that helped you with these thoughts, generated these thoughts, or there books you would recommend yes. along these lines? Um, I can send them to you. The thing that triggered this, this thought process for me was something Harlem taught. Um, he, they well, call brief it therapy. In the world, it's called, yeah, brief therapy, solution, focus. Um, but I'm very, very hesitant. No, I'm, I'm actually paranoid about introducing any kind of psychology right. to the church. I just don't believe that Christ in the Bible has to be enough. Yeah. Yeah. And if someone found truth in the world, then I have to be able to find it all in the scriptures. Otherwise, it just doesn't work for me. Yeah. Right. Um, so I felt like I took certain things that just totally seemed to make sense, and I decided 
let me see if literally I can completely scripturalize every single thing that I'm talking about. And does it ring true from beginning to end? Yeah. And, um, um, and I think uh, lots of those materials are good, but of course it, in the psychology world it's, it's more about what is it that you want, which isn't necessarily <laughs> what Christ wants. So it's not about your solution, it's about Christ's solution. Yeah. Um, small things like that, but they have to be tweaked, otherwise it gets off track a little bit. Um, I sat down with Harlem and showed him all these notes, and he loved it. And he's going to change, you know, he's going to do it different. Um, but I think, I think there's some good things you can pull out of the world, but they're only good because they <laughs> resemble the truth of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. So then... The Christians can benefit that we find truth that someone else has undug, but we have to bring it back through the Bible yeah. and filter out everything that doesn't ring totally true with the Scripture yeah. and keep what is true with the Scripture. Um, and don't go beyond what's written. Don't, don't try and... You can't lay any foundation other than Christ, period. So, and I feel very comfortable about preaching that. Um, Amen. But I don't feel comfortable about um, teaching psychology I guess you would call it to a church I don't but I think there's nuggets of gold and wisdom there we can totally use but it, it needs to be in the Bible so I, so I can send you the, there's there's four or five books I read um, and then I just decided to go reread the entire Bible looking for any instance of this in there's tons of stuff I mean like the David thing it's just you know, there, there's lots of good, good stuff. Mm. Um, amen? Amen. Uh-huh. Um, I love this. I think this is so helpful, especially in helping uh, the disciples develop their own convictions mm -hmm. and really bring them back to Jesus and the Bible. My question to you is, there's, is there a point where you're, you're like, okay, we've talked about this. There's a lack of repentance. Is there a point where you're like, okay, this is you know, calling to a decision kind uh -huh. of time. Like, you, I'm, this is no longer in your hands. Right, right. This is, this is a matter of, you know, at what point do you feel like, okay, this is, you know, I'm kind of, I'm trying to help you come to your own convictions, but at this point there's, right. this is where it kind of... It's rebelliousness. Yeah. So is there is there a specific thing you're looking for, like a just complete lack of repentance or effort in homework? Or, well, right. I know you, you can even talk about, like, if they don't do it, maybe we'll tweak it and find it more successful right you know at what point do you say yeah <laughs> this is not about the homework this is really the, where your heart is kind of like what you did with the guy who's like i don't believe in god well, what, what's really right the underlying reason why this is not you know, right you're not seeing significant progress or even the, the jumping ones or twos or fours to fives or right right um i think um like sometimes with purity, with the brothers, um, I'm saying the brothers because I work with the brothers, obviously, on this. <laughs> I'm not sure. But I think sometimes there's a lack. You feel like they're not taking it serious. And then, you know, in the, in the small group, we'll, we'll be talking about it, and I'll say, um, things like, l l let's read verses of, what happens if we don't deal with things? Right. What does the Bible say if we let things go? Um, or if it's not changing, what do you need from us? What do you need from us? Because we're concerned. We really want to help you, and we totally believe God can give you victory here. What, what you said you were going to do the last three weeks, you either didn't do it or it didn't work. So how about we share with you some ideas? I mean, we can, we can um, start to give more input. Um, and then, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's even a place at times when, uh, um, you know, it's actually very helpful. We had a brother who was missing church regularly and the small group sat him down and it's good because the whole small group took responsibility for him. And uh, it's not just the leader dealing with him, it's a small group. And, and then the leader sat down with the small group and says, how do you feel about George not coming? How do you feel? How do you feel? It's discouraging. It's hard. I'm sad. Okay. This week, we're going to pray for God to do a miracle in George's life. 
What can you do to encourage George this week? What can you do to strengthen George this week? This is what I can do to strengthen George. And the whole small group is going to do something to strengthen George. So that everyone, engage, everyone has their own project in their head of what they believe they can really connect George with and get George to repent. And then they, the whole small group then goes to George and says, look, we've done this, we've done that, we've tried this, we've tried that. And you read the, the, the verse, you know, be patient with the weak, kind, whatever, and, and, and warn the idol. And say, George, we, we don't want to believe this about you, but you're just, it's as if you don't even want to be a Christian. And then you start going down the line of the verses if you continue in sin or whatever. And I think then the whole small group would think, you know, George probably needs to come out of the membership or George needs to stop calling himself a Christian. This isn't, this isn't Christianity. And the whole small group engages with him. Um, it's not just the leader trying to pound on him, but the whole small group is witnessing it is wrong. They're trying to encourage him first, but then they're all dealing with him. Right. Um, which is good because there have been times when the leader kicks some, you know, something happened and the guy left, and then he tells the other people in the small group, well, the leader was just this way or that way. And, yeah. and, then, and then they remember the line or bear where the leader actually treated them that way, and they're like, yeah, our leader is that way, you know. <laughs> and then it actually all goes the wrong direction. And, um, but it's been very helpful to have the whole small group. That's the good thing about these things, that they see someone creates homework for themselves. They never do it. They're not engaging. But the, the first goal is what's missing? What, what grace is missing in this guy's life that he needs to help really get turned around? Because we want the small group to believe there's no situation that can't get turned around. Right. Amen. Except the clear decision, I don't want to turn around. Right. right. So the whole small group either insists that he can do it, let's keep finding a way to do it, and then after about five or six weeks, they're like, you don't want this, do you? So why are you still here if you don't want this at all? And then it helps deal with him, and then that small group learns and is healthy from it. Um, it didn't become the, only the leader's burden. Um, and in most cases, I think it wins them back. You know, they see the whole group really loves them, and um, it kind of leaves them without excuse. So I think... That's a more healthy way because unfortunately the way it's done in the past is the leader engages, he doesn't really change, drags on for a month or two, doesn't really happen, then you go and then you're a little too strong than you probably should have been because you're so frustrated. <laughs> and then he comes back and complains that you're harsh. And then the Bible talks kind of watching, hmm, who's right, who's wrong, is the leader harsh or is, or is he really uh, weak? And, yeah. and then everyone's playing judge and jury about who's really at fault here. And, it's better to have the concrete weekly process with concrete tasks that this person concretely ignored. <laughs> and then you just draw the conclusion, wow, I guess Chris, this, this, this really isn't what you want, is it? No, it is, it is, it is. Okay, so then you explain to us, what is it you're going to, you know, what, what's your step? And then you look at all the verses, look in your mirror and not change. You, you deceive, you know, there's all kinds of verses you can look at that expose that, and then, not in judgmental, but let us help you. So this week it'll change. And I love the idea that, you know, we give the small group usually two weeks in a row. What could you do this week to strengthen George spiritually? I'll invite him over to spend the night. I'll get up and have a quiet time with him. I'll bake him some cookies and bring it over. I mean, there's the whole Bible talking engages and just bombs George with encouragement and verses. And, Amen. and everyone's trying. Wow. And then it just exposes George's folly. It's not just the leader, I don't have time to give them this week, I'll give them next week, then it was harsh and right, right. And then that leader's overwhelmed, he's, he's burdened that this guy's doing bad spiritually. The, the, the small group doesn't know what's going on. They're noticing things, but they don't understand it. Mm, good insight. So I think these are, this, once this gets on a stability level of them interacting with each other, then, then it really exposes the folly, it exposes does that make sense? Yeah. Uh -huh. Maybe just one, one more. Okay, last one. Yes. <laughs> oh, Pick 10. Um, this is great. It seems like you've trained all your small group leaders yes. to um, to think through this model or how they, yes. how they approach. Um, two questions. One is, did you teach it like you're teaching us? 
And secondly, um, it seems like as you were going through um, examples, you gave a, a very um, clear process. Like the topic is patience. Where where have you been? What has been the best? What is the best the best time you ever been here? Or fight up about you know? Right. So you kind of went down. So I'm trying to figure out um, how did you do small group, but also if you can in a very simplistic way, you know, kind of break down just how they go through that. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I'm sorry. No, no, sorry. no, that's good. I figured that'd be a very easy question, but no, yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I think with the um, we did it. It was a weekend. We did it for all this. We rented a hall from like ten in the morning till four in the afternoon, two days in a row, and I broke it into eight sections, as you noticed. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Um, and basically what we did is after each little section, um, I gave them a homework. I printed it out ahead of time, and they'd sit down in their small group and do it. And they would role play it. And then I would do it on stage. I would have, after each session, someone different would come up on stage with something that they wanted to make progress in. Or we, we played out a couple conflict in marriages or conflict with kids or whatever. And we just played it out on stage, and they watched it. Um, now at the end of that probably nobody really knew how to do this and it made people more nervous than it made them feel like they learned something new so but I just think it's a process it's a time of just just keep going um, because focusing people in on their problems definitely is not the answer focusing them on Christ is definitely the right thing um, how to know which questions to ask or or when I just need to not be discipling but more teaching because right. teaching is different you need to sit on a teacher small group. You need to write lessons and teach them. This isn't replacing teaching. Um, this is replacing getting people unstuck, kind of. It's, it's not me unstucking them. It's Christ and them working together to get unstuck. I'm just guiding the process. So this isn't the end all and all that stuff. But I've just noticed that in the Kiev church, we have 2,000 members. Um, we're seeing about 100 to 150 to 180 maybe baptisms a year. There's 500 small groups of four members each, basically. Three to five is typical small group size. Wow. And if those 500 small groups begged God to help someone become a Christian every year, my guess is that it would probably happen. Um, but probably 50 to 60 percent of our church is not banging on all cylinders right they're not they're not they're, they're the third soil they're not dead sure. they're good good people but they're not being fruitful their, their life is not bearing fruit so and those 20 percent that can do all the baptisms they're also the ones solving all the problems of the church so I, I've hamstrung the people that can actually convert so somehow We've got to get the Christians to engage with Christ personally, to be able to find solutions with the mind of Christ that they've been given, to believe that they are a new creation already. They just have to continue to go in that direction and see progress. And then that frees up the 20% for sure, and then they can pull behind them another 20 or 30, and we can see 50% of the church. Um, and if we can have 50 next year, then 60 the next year, and you know it'll probably never be 100 because everyone has their their years, but the Kiev church went from 150 to 500, 500 to 1,000, 1,000 to 1,700. That was the four years of growth. Whoa. That's a lot of growth. Yeah. Now we're going from 1,800 to 1,840 to 1,880, 1,920, 1,940, oh, 1,920, 2,000. 2040. Sure. Uh, amen. Praise God for every saved soul. Yeah. But I totally believe it could be different than that. Yeah. It's got to be different than that. Yeah. Mm. If it can't be different than that, then half my Bible's not true. Mm. Mm. I just can't accept that. Right. That's unacceptable to me. Yeah. And the answer is not me working harder. Right. And it's not me fasting more. It's every Christian figuring this out for themselves. And I am the, a big part of the problem. The way I lead and the way I treat people is a big part of the problem. 
So I have to tweak myself. And it's like putting on a new pair of jeans that's one size too small. <laughs> it's not comfortable in the beginning, but I just have to keep going. <laughs> and then fast. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> Amen. So let me, let me close with this thought. I just think... We see the bathing suits they wear in Kiev. I think out of out of this stuff that, that I'm using, I'm probably effectively using it at about a 60% level. My staff right now, after about a year, is probably at a 20 or 30% level. The small group leaders, maybe there's 5% that actually know what we're talking about. <laughs> but if every year we keep increasing it, if we can, if we can keep increasing it, 5, 10 years down the line, we're going to have a whole generation of people that are not so codependent that are turning to Christ. And, and that'll be progress. Yeah. It's not going to happen overnight. I can't get discouraged. I can't give up. And, and I don't want to go look for the next silver bullet. It's, it's Christ. It just has to be Christ. So I just think I just have to keep plugging away, keep working on this, keep practicing it, and God will teach. The Spirit will teach. Um, and I believe we can grow in this. But I, I, I really believe our movement... Could, could do so much more than it is. I really yeah. believe yeah. it. Yeah. And you know, you, the disciples are amazing. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, God is amazing. And this world is so lost. Mm -hmm. And it's so dark. Mm -hmm. And it's so scary to be a non-Christian. It is so scary. Mm -hmm. So scary. Mm -hmm. So we got everything going for us. Mm -hmm. Everything is pointed in our direction just has got to be Christ. We just have to stay with Christ. He is the answer. He is the power. He is the shield. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Right. Yeah. We just have to keep going towards him. Amen. 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 Amen.